On behalf of the Berkeley Center, I would like to welcome you to this evening's exciting program, a discussion of the legacy of Reinhold Niebuhr and the future of Christian realism. The Berkeley Center's work explores the intersection of religion and politics around the globe and across diverse issues. Among our programs is a program on the future of political theologies, which maps and analyzes historic and contemporary understandings of political engagement across global Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. The project brings together leading thinkers and practitioners within each tradition, as well as secular counterparts, to examine core questions at the intersection of theologies of the political. The program this evening is timely for many reasons. As we enter a new age of executive power in the United States, Niebuhr's work is again in the public mind, as President Obama has indicated his deep interest in Reinhold Niebuhr's writings. More importantly, as an academic, Niebuhr's work endures in important ways, speaking to our present age about the tragic nature of human power, the importance of humility, realism, and hope in conducting the affairs of this world. We have many lessons yet to learn from his teachings. It is now my pleasure to welcome the participants in this evening's discussion. David Brooks, E.J. Dion, and Krista Tippett, who will explore some of these issues in the next 90 minutes. David Brooks became an op-ed columnist for the New York Times in 2003. He has been a senior editor at the Weekly Standard, a contributing editor at Newsweek and the Atlantic Monthly, and is currently a commentator on the NewsHour with Jim Lehrer. Mr. Brooks began his career in New York City and joined the Washington Times in 1984 as a writer of editorials and film reviews. Two years later, he became an editor and foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, later becoming op-ed editor. In 1995, he joined the Weekly Standard at its inception. He is the author of Bobos in Paradise, The New Upper Class and How They Got There, and On Paradise Drive, How We Live Now, and always have in the, in the future tense. He is also a frequent commentator on National Public Radio, CNN's Late Edition, and The Diane Reem Show. Mr. Brooks graduated with a BA in History from the University of Chicago in 1983. I'm always happy to welcome fellow Chicago grads to Georgetown. E.J. Dion writes a column for the Washington Post, which is nationally syndicated in over 90 outlets. Besides being a renowned columnist, he is also an accomplished scholar of religion and politics. He is a university professor in the Foundations of Democracy and Culture at Georgetown, serving in the Public Policy Institute and the Department of Government. He is also a senior fellow in the Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution. EJ's book, Why Americans Hate Politics, won the LA Times Book Prize in 1991, and was a National Book Award nominee. He is also author of, and pay attention to this uh, sequence of titles, They Only Look Dead, Why Progressives Will Dominate the Next Political Era. era. Get that right. <laughs> that was fair and balanced of you. <laughs> Stand Up, Fight Back, Republican Toughs, Democratic Wimps, and The Politics of Revenge, and last year, Sold Out reclaiming faith and politics after the religious right. Krista Tippett of American Public Media Speaking of Faith will moderate the conversation and portions of the program may appear as a segment in the future on the program. Krista studied at Brown University and worked as the New York Times stringer in Divided Berlin and reported as well for Newsweek, the International Herald Tribune, the BBC, and Die Zeit. Later, she served as special political assistant and chief Berlin aide to the U.S. ambassador to West Germany. Her weekly public radio show, Speaking of Faith, takes listeners well beyond the wedge issues and modern-day culture wars. Instead, public radio's premier conversation about, public, about religion, meaning, ethics, and ideas forges fascinating new dialogue around some of the largest and most difficult topics of our time. Each week, Krista welcomes guests from a wide range of backgrounds who together shed new light on spiritual and intellectual perspectives. In Washington, D.C., WAMU 88.5 broadcasts Speaking of Faith on Sundays at 7 a.m. 
We also have a special treat to begin. Professor Jean Bethke Elstein will open this evening's program with a special reading from Reinhold Niebuhr's work. Jean is the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Chair in the Foundations of American Democracy at Georgetown, a multi-year visiting appointment in the Department of Government, in addition to her permanent position as the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Professor of Social and Political Ethics at the University of Chicago. She is a senior fellow in residence at the Berkeley Center. A prominent public intellectual, Professor Elshane studies the connections between ethical and political convictions. Finally, you may have noticed a more extensive production crew behind you this evening, and I welcome the team from American Public Media coming down through an ice storm from Minnesota who will be producing the program for Speaking of Faith. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me and please join me in welcoming Professor Jean Elshane. Good evening. On this occasion, as we anticipate a lively discussion between our two distinguished interlocutors, it is important to recall that Reinhold Niebuhr was not only a prolific writer, commenting on all the critical issues of his time, but also a pastor. As a pastor, he penned memorable sermons and prayers. So as prelude to our discussion, I will read one of Niebuhr's civic prayers. O oh Lord, unless you build this house, its builders will have toiled in vain. Unless you watch over the city, in vain the watchman stands on guard. Look with mercy upon this company of your children, that our labors may be crowned by your grace. Help us to be diligent in the disciplines of our calling, and to engage in them in the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Bind us together through our common responsibilities, and prevent by your grace the friction of sinful purpose from destroying the unity of the body of Christ. Give us the spirit of forbearance for one another, teaching us to forgive one another even as you also in Christ have forgiven us. Help us to do the duty which each hour and day demands of us, but grant us grace also to have a vision of the constancy of your will about the chances and changes of our mortal life. Let us not be tempted by our weakness to evade the tasks you have given us to do, nor be tempted by our strengths to estimate ourselves too highly. Grant that our strength may be made perfect in our weakness and your mercy purify what we have corrupted. O oh Lord, rule and overrule our affections and wills that your kingdom may come even through the confusion of human passions and your will be done despite the unruly affections of men. Look with mercy upon the peoples of the world, so full of pride and confusion, so sure of their righteousness, and so deeply involved in unrighteousness, so confident of their power, and so imprisoned by their fears of each other. Have mercy upon your own nation, called to such high responsibilities in the affairs of humankind. Purchase of the vain glory, which confuses our councils and gives our leaders and our people and give our leaders and our people the wisdom of humility and clarity. Help us to recognize our own affinity with whatever truculence or malice confronting us, that we may not add to the world's woes by the fury of our own resentments. Give your church the grace in this time to be as a saving remnant among the nations reminding all peoples of the divine majesty under whose judgment they stand and of the divine mercy in which they and we have a common need. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> Hello. Um, I am pleased to have David Brooks on my left. And E.J. Dion on my right. I'm delighted to be in the middle, but I really don't want you to give us much credit for coming through the ice storm because we came from Minnesota, and like the president, we don't think an ice storm is that big a deal. <laughs> um, we started Speaking of Faith as a weekly national program in 2003, and from the earliest days of the program, Niebuhr's name was a recurring refrain, and we realized pretty soon that we needed to devote a program to him. 
he was quoted by an evangelical political analyst, a member of, the, of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, an Indian journalist, a secular war correspondent, an African-American Harvard chaplain. We created a program on him. Jean Bethke Elstein was part of that, and Robin Lovin was as well. He's here tonight. Um, and it was absolutely absorbing and thrilling. And we also decided back then, we've, been, we've spent these five years creating the show, but when we get to the point at which, like every public radio program, we have T-shirts and coffee mugs, we will have one that says, after, uh, in honor of the great for opening line of Niebuhr's The Nature and Destiny of Man, ours will say, I am my own most vexing problem. <laughs> because that's what life always comes back down to. Um, I remember in that interview I had with Robin Lovin, who is one of the great biographers of Reinhold Niebuhr, he, he said that uh, he talked about things that should make a Niebuhrian alarm bells ring. And we've used that phrase around the office sometimes, my Niebuhrian alarm bells are ringing. <laughs> um, and we've done it in jest, but it's actually a very helpful uh, phrase. And I have to say that uh, with everything that's been going on in the world, Recently, my Niborian alarm bells have been ringing off the hook. <laughs> and I, I don't think that uh, this discussion tonight could be more relevant or more provocative. It's not just that President Barack Obama has called Reinhold Niebuhr his favorite philosopher. Um, it is that Niebuhr's favorite words and ideas, words like irony and paradox and tragedy, are gaining new resonance in this historical moment. I even think that Americans, uh, due to the pressure of historical circumstances, may be acquainting themselves again with the term ambiguity, uncharacteristically. Um, let me tell you how the evening is going to unfold. We're gonna have a conversation among ourselves for about 45 minutes. Um, about 30, 30, 40 minutes from now, I believe you were given cards to write questions on or raise your hand if you want one. Um, I'll let you know a little way in when uh, people will be collecting those and uh, Michael Kessler will come back up and will engage with you. And there's a lot to talk about, so we better get going. But I did think I would, uh, it was right, really fun to delve back into Niebuhr preparing for this tonight. And, Here's one of the many uh, paragraphs that um, I thought could not speak more directly to the present from uh, his book, The Irony of American History. Um, and they speak to the economic present as much as the political present, although that was not his focus. Uh, he wrote, in one sense, the opulence of American life has served to perpetuate Jeffersonian illusions about human nature. For we have thus far sought to solve all our problems by the expansion of our economy. This expansion cannot go on forever, and ultimately we must face some vexatious issues of social justice. Um, I'd like to begin by asking the two of you to say a little bit about your exposure to Niebuhr, how you discovered him, um, you know, and if he's been on your mind lately, what it is about him that has impressed you or shaped you. Do you want to start, David? Uh, I'll go first uh, because I actually had the Niebuhr scoop. Uh, I'm the guy who asked Barack Obama if he ever read Reinhold Niebuhr, I think, first among journalists this cycle. Uh, so I'll just tell that story. But first, let me say it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, uh, there are a lot of U of C, U of Chicago people here. They say of the University of Chicago that it's a Baptist school where Jewish professors teach atheist students St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'm glad to be a, a Jew at a Catholic school discussing Niebuhr. Uh, now, uh, I'll start out with, with this story, and this is the Obama story. I was interviewing Obama about it a year ago over the phone, and it was a long day, and I got to him at the end of the day. And uh, finally, we were talking about something, I think, um, AIDS policies in Africa, and then some minor economic policy, and then political stuff. And the interview was going nowhere. Obama was tired, he was a little cranky, or maybe it was just I was annoying him. Uh, and so I'm, I'm getting nothing out of this interview. So I, out of the blue, say, you ever read Reinhold Niebuhr? And we, we were talking about nothing related. And he said, yeah, I do. And so I said, um, well, what does he mean to you? And he proceeded to give a 20-minute summation of the irony of American history. 
in perfect paragraph form. Uh, now, I was trying to count, as he was talking, I was trying to count the number of U.S. senators who could talk 20 minutes about Reinhold Niebuhr. <laughs> and the answer is one, or was one. Uh, now, probably zero. Uh, well, that may be Lieberman. Uh, it, and so, you know, I was really struck by that. Uh, and of course, as Chris Matthews would say, I felt a tingle up my leg. Uh, but, uh, but I, you know, there are a lot of serious things which we'll get into. But just the one I'd mention immediately is, well, the two I'll mention. One, the inaugural address. The thing, or, yes, the inaugural address. The thing that really struck me about that address was it was such a joyous occasion here in Washington, whether you voted for Obama or not. The atmosphere was truly joyous. And yet I thought in that inaugural dress, there was a wintry spine to it. That it was, we must put away childish things, we've been greedy, uh, times are tough. Uh, and there was uh, your Niburian alarm bells uh, were probably going off, although Prozac helps. Uh, <laughs> And so that, that's one thing. And then the second thing, and this is really my central tension about Niebuhr and goes to your point about the economy. Niebuhr warns us of a lot of useful things about humility, about tragedy, about sin, about modesty. As Americans, we have a counter tradition which counsels optimism, daringness, risk taking, and reconciling the two Staying American in the most optimistic, ebullient sense of that word, while being conscious of Niebuhr is the central challenge. And so as we think about this stimulus package, spending $890 billion on a process we basically don't understand is a risky endeavor. And so proceeding while being conscious of modesty is a perfect example of a Niebuhrian challenge. Mm -hmm. E.J. Only my friend David Brooks is skillful enough to give a learned commentary on Reinhold Niebuhr and end with a shot at the Democrat <laughs> stimulus plan. <laughs> now what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was very impressive. Um, but it was I, a it was new, Niebuhrian a style shot. It was a, right. not a shot, it was a realistic appraisal. Yes. So, <laughs> as I said, a shot at the stimulus plan. Um, <laughs> I also want to say how happy I am to be here. I love that prayer that uh, Jean read, and um, I took note of the danger of overestimating yourself, and I know I will not overestimate myself tonight because I know that Jean is here, Robin Lovin is here, Sean Casey is here, my old pastor, Father Tom Duffy, Monsignor Tom Duffy is here, so there is, I will have proper Niburian humility, I uh, hope, in the presence of these folks. And the thing that I just want to say that about Niebuhr, the, uh, Georgetown is a basketball school. I can say this, and people will know how serious this comparison is. Basically, Reinhold Niebuhr is the Michael Jordan of theology. You may recall when Jordan played basketball, everybody wanted to be like Mike. And it is extraordinary across the political spectrum how everybody wants to be like Reine. You asked how one discovered Niebuhr. I believe. I first ran across Niebuhr in an article by Michael Novak in 1972 in Commentary, which I recently reread, called Needing Niebuhr Again. Right. Uh, yeah. And what I have been struck by over the years is how all of God's children claim uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. Mike uh, later wrote in a sort of his, as Mike was sort of moving toward the right at that moment, he was kind of in the middle of the journey when he wrote that Niebuhr piece. Um, but he claimed him as the first neoconservative, arguing that he was a neoconservative uh, because of his Cold War position, his skepticism of totalitarianism, and so on. Um, this would, uh, was anathema to another of his best friends who's written powerfully on him, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who was very close uh, to Niebuhr and who would always argue that he was a Schlesinger-style liberal. I lean toward Schlesinger's view on this, but I see where Mike is coming from. I found an article in First Things claiming him as a certain kind of conservative. There is something extraordinary about this, um, and I don't think it's because Niebuhr's unclear. Um, mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I was taken by Niebuhr at that moment in the early uh, 1970s for the reason a lot of people got, were taken by him at various points uh, in history, which is 
that he was a progressive who believed in original sin. Uh, and I thought that, as you know, it is often ascribed to Niebuhr that he said uh, original sin is the only empirically verifiable doctrine of the Christian church. Yeah. Um, he said you only have to read today's yeah. newspaper to see that it's true. Actually, he didn't. He, I went back and looked for it. He was actually quoting a British writer uh, and never claimed credit for this, so he practiced Niburian humility. Um, but he, and that, that it seems to me that uh, I'm, I'm sort of taking what David said and turning on, on its head a little bit. The joy of a progressive worldview or a liberal worldview is indeed its hopefulness, its optimism, uh, its sense of human possibility. But the core weakness of that worldview, as Niebuhr always understood, uh, was a lack of awareness of human frailty, the human capacity to sin. And at that moment in the, in the early 70s, he struck me as an excellent corrective to what is going on. And I think perhaps we all quote Niebuhr because he's always an excellent corrective to everyone's <laughs> enthusiasms uh, at a given moment. And before this is over, I will certainly offer some Niburian quotes that raise questions about President Bush's foreign policy, uh, which David actually struggled with early on in the, in the war. Um, but I think it's this, um, you know, that his, his insistence on sort of having us judge ourselves seriously embodied very well by that most demanding of prayers <laughs> that Gene read. And that may be the most demanding prayer I have ever heard in my life. Let's, um, let's talk about liberalism. You know, there's, with the advent of this new administration, there's a, there's a growing, there's suddenly this public reflection bubbling up about what liberalism means, what it has historically meant, what that word should connote. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that uh, many people would put, let's say, if they knew about Niebuhr, whether they would put him in the box that liberalism has become. So I, I wonder if you would talk about um, how, in your view, Niebuhr's legacy uh, uh, as a, a classic liberal might inform our current thinking about this, how uh, Barack Obama might be following in that legacy. Well, uh, first... The former liberal David Brooks yeah, should answer that. Uh, it depends <laughs> who you ask. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to first start with conservatism. Uh, to me, the core of conservatism is epistemological modesty and original sin, awareness of these two things. Now, Republican Party has drifted far away from this. But this is the core of conservatism, that we don't know much about the world, that we are therefore beholden to the traditions and institutions which we inherit. This is Burke in a more spiritual way, and this is Michael Oakeshott. This is supposed to be the core, and in many ways it's, it's Hayek and Milton Friedman. And this is, I think Niebuhr gave you, and the reason I think, I don't, I don't know whether he was conservative or liberal, and I, it's like the Orwell debates, you just never, you never get to the bottom of that. He was a liberal in his time, uh, the sort of liberal we could do business with. Uh, <laughs> and, but, I, I, and I, but I think he transcends that. He, he captures conservative attention because he does share that sympathy. When you read him, you see modesty, you see epistemological modesty, you see a tragic vision of human nature, you see original sin. And that, that resonates with a lot of conservatives. But again, you say that's a classic conservatism as opposed to the box conservatism has become. Well, I would say it's not Tom DeLay. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, Although he probably does believe in original sin. He probably does. Um, and practices. In fairness to Tom DeLay. Uh, uh, now, now, as for liberalism, it seems to me the, the, one, the one thing that really, uh, to me, powerfully overlaps between what we think of as modern American political liberalism and Niebuhr was brought to my mind by an outstanding book called The Stone of Hope by a guy whose last name I believe was Chappelle, C-H-A-P-P-E-L, which I highly recommend, which was about uh, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. And the essential contrast in this book was between the basically Northeastern white liberals and Gunnar Myrdal, who came over to analyze race relations, and the Southern preachers mostly black liberal preachers in the Niburian tradition. The white liberals, according to this book, argued that Americans are good-hearted, 
once you educate them about how segregation betrays their core faith, it'll be fine. We will have a slow, gradual process away from segregation and racism by sheer power of enlightenment and education. Now, Martin Luther King, being a Niburian, took a much darker view of human nature and said, hell no, that will not be enough. And we are gonna have to force some things here. And so the aggressiveness of King and a lot of the civil rights movement, in a, in a sense, grew out of that Niburian view of human nature. And to me, that does represent one of the, obviously, the, the most inspiring episode in modern liberalism. Although there was some tension between the way King used Niebuhr and the way Niebuhr thought about social change. Um, you know, he was a force for race relations in Detroit, but he didn't believe that you could force social, that, that in the enlightened could force social change. Well, well, this is the tension that EJ and I have been talking about. Yes. How risky do you get? How much do you force? Uh, if you believe in original sin, do you then just adopt, and I'm not saying Niebuhr did, but it does lead you in a bit of a fatalistic direction. Mm -hmm. uh, but King obviously turned it around. Mm -hmm. And this is the American twist on Niebuhr, who was an American. Yeah. You know, I'm glad David raised the, um, you know, the, the original sin as a core conservative doctrine, because I've found in the last 10, 15 years that I've often spoken to conservative friends and said, you know, original sin is probably the smartest conservative idea there is, and I don't know why you guys abandoned it. Uh, and David is someone who hasn't uh, uh, fully, uh, hasn't really ever abandoned it. You know, just to take Niebuhr on his terms uh, as to who he was, as, as a lot of you know, um, he really was a socialist early on in his life, and Moral Man and Immoral Society, his early book, stands in some contrast with his later books, although he never renounced it, and he's he tried to make it consistent with his entire work, although I see uh, some real uh, tension there. Um, he drifted away from socialism and toward pure New Deal liberalism, but importantly also moved from pacifism uh, to a kind of just war view of the world in response uh, to Hitler. And one important moment in his life, he broke with the liberal Protestants at the Christian century that great ongoing uh, liberal Protestant magazine and started a magazine called Christianity uh, in Crisis, which, uh, and Crisis, which as far as I can tell later, ended up slightly to the somewhere to the left of where Niebuhr was when the magazine uh, shut its doors, or at least it was uh, uh, that way. But you know, partly on the testimony of those, I think, who knew him best, you have to say Niebuhr was not only a liberal, but really at the heart of the American Liberal Project. I, you know, he was a founder of Americans for Democratic Action. Um, you know, I think Arthur Schlesinger's testimony on this is good. His daughter, Elizabeth Sifton's testimony on this uh, is good. And American liberalism, as interpreted by Niebuhr, and I think it was quite mainstream, uh, was always uh, a kind of principled pragmatism. Um, that it was not doctrinaire. Niebuhr was not, uh, he believed in Christian doctrine, but he was not doctrinaire. Um, and it was about the possibilities of politics, but it did not see, it was, it, liberalism did not see politics as having limitless, politi uh, uh, limitless possibilities or answering all questions. My friend Gene Elshane, he was an Augustinian, and Gene is uh, a great Ag uh, Augustine scholar. And before I came, I found this, uh, uh, I've quoted this before, Gene's great quote on Augustine, which I think very much applies to Niebuhr. If Augustine is a thorn in the side of those who would cure the universe once and for all, he similarly torments critics who disdain any project of human community or justice or possibility. Wisdom, Jean said, comes from experiencing fully the ambivalence and the ambiguity of the human condition. That is a very Niburian thought. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very liberal thought in the broad sense of that word. And yes, and it's an ambiguity that Niebuhr himself felt uh, had, was being abandoned um, by liberals, right? Um, and you know, I think w one thing, for example, in this classic liberalism, it's, it's not that Niebuhr, and you know, maybe we'll get to this, it's not that he spoke, he certainly didn't proselytize, it's not that he spoke in, to, to issues of policy in religious terms, but he had a much more sophisticated religion and taking faith seriously as an aspect of life, and these religious ideas were much more integrated into his political worldview. I was really interested, looking back at Barack Obama's... Could I just say something yes. real quick about yes. that? I mean, he really did bring 
religious uh, views and religious commitments to his public positions, but we just got accustomed to a very bizarre way of doing that circa 1980. Uh, you know, with the rise of the Christian conservative movement and that certain kinds of preachers in that movement uh, did not have the subtlety of Niebuhr. Right, but um, I, and, yeah. you know, I was thinking that, you know, we all long for the new Niebuhr, but no talk show in the United States would ever have Niebuhr as a guest right now uh, because <laughs> yeah. of that uh, Also, because I think he would be uh, categorically against sound bites. But, but, yeah, um, although he's had he great sound bites. Yeah, he, he was, was good at sound bites. Really all right. But, um, but, but, you know, liberals before the 1980s forgot, for example, that Martin Luther King Jr. was a preacher first and a civil rights activist second, right? I mean, that, the disconnect was, happened with liberals as well. They went the other direction. I was really fascinated when I was, because what I st was doing as I was preparing for this is looking for echoes in Obama in particular, and Niebuhr, and I, I came to feel that he's channeling the guy in part. Um, I was looking at this speech he gave at Call to Renewal in 2006, a very important speech on religion and public life. And he tells this story about an attack that Alan Keyes made on him when he was uh, running against him for the Senate, uh, questioned whether Obama was really a Christian because of his stance on abortion. And Obama says, unwilling to go there, I answered with what has come to be the typically liberal response in such debates. Namely, I said that we live in a pluralistic society, that I can't impose my religious views on another. Then he, then he goes on in this speech to speak of his nagging unease afterwards. And he starts to talk about how what is important to him um, is that the Democratic Party uh, should join a serious debate about how to reconcile faith with our modern pluralistic democracy. Now, I think, you know, you saw at the Democratic Convention this year that a lot of Democrats were also making that move. It seems like Obama is kind of out ahead of it. Uh, inviting Rick Warren to speak at the inauguration was one sign of that. Um, I just think that's an interesting Well, a lot of Democrats discovered God in the 2004 exit polls. <laughs> right. You said that. Um, and God can There's be, that too. God can be discovered anywhere. There's yes. nothing wrong with uh, exit polls. But I, I think that's not, but having said that, that's actually not fair to a whole lot of Democrats, including Obama, um, who, you know, I think the party always had um, you know, I mean, this is a party that was rooted in so many ways in Catholic social thought. The New Deal, in many ways, comes out of uh, Catholic social thought. Um, Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt's rhetoric, and from what one can tell, Roosevelt himself, if there's a characteristic liberal Democrat, it's Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and this was a very much part of him. I think in the 60s, there did develop some splits uh, within liberalism and among Democrats. I don't think this um, stream, this religious stream, ever went away, but it did sort of, it did go uh, underground. And in sort of the, um, uh, this is another Elshtanian point, uh, arguments about church-state separation were kind of um, sort of moved beyond that to the notion that you can separate religion from politics. And in the American tradition, you can never separate, fully separate uh, religion from politics, so those are quite different uh, things. Mm -hmm. um, I want to uh, tell you about another echo I found. Um, now, of course, it's really not clear um, how the foreign policy of the Obama administration is going to play out. Uh, it's partly because the focus is so much on the economy right now. Um, but there's, there's kind of an interesting ideological debate that's part of how we're analyzing that and what it looks like. Um, so here's, but here's Reinhold Niebuhr, again, talk, uh, kind of criticizing liberalism or kind of redefining it, saying, in the liberal world, the evils of human nature and history were ascribed to social institutions or ignorance or some manageable defect in human nature and environment. That's what you said, David. Um, Barack Obama, then I find him talking about inner city problems and talking about, at the same time that he's talking about programs that will address this, he, he describes speaking with a young man and about seeing holes in hearts that government alone cannot fix. Now, what we have right now in the first weeks of the administration is, a 800, is an $819 billion stimulus package that is government programs and money. But I just wonder if either one of you have any sense of how, um, 
this insight about there, about there being something about human nature that needs to be addressed, as well as government programs, um, how that might find expression in the Obama administration in and beyond the stimulus package. Well, I, I, well to wrap up uh, well, your question, what EJ said, you know, to me, faith plays in politics because it embodies a view of human nature. If you, as you just suggested, have a view of human nature that human beings are born innocent and are made corrupt by institutions, then that, a series of policies flow from and that. And can be fixed by institutions. Right, and, and mm -hmm. some of those policies will involve liberating the, the individual from the, um, the oppression of phonics, uh, or, <laughs> you know, or, or other educational things, or the liberation from the traditional family. If, however, you have a view of human nature that is, people are born with certain tragic qualities, uh, you could be religious or not. You know, I've always thought one of the presidents who learned the most from Niebuhr was Abraham Lincoln, who must have read Niebuhr quite a lot, uh, <laughs> because they, 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 their thinking he overlaps. He quoted him on television. I think he did. I think he did. Well, I, I was actually interviewing Lincoln one afternoon. Uh, no. and, and so, but if you have a different, more tragic view, as Lincoln did, uh, as I think Niebuhr did, and as I think Obama did, uh, then that implies a different set of, of policies. And basically what it implies, and I think this is completely borne out by evolutionary theory as exemplified by E.O. Wilson and others, which is that people are born with certain natu naturally nasty proclivities, and therefore you need institutions to civilize them, tame them, uplift them. And therefore, it's not a question of are you using government or not using government, it's what are you using it for? And if you are using government to surround individuals with institutions, whether it's a two-parent family, or as Obama wants to do, uh, spread something called the Harlem Children's Zone around the country. The Harlem Children's Zone is a, is a, is a project run by a guy named Jeffrey Canada in Harlem. And basically, he said, Education doesn't, education alone won't solve the problems of the kids in my area of Harlem. Family policies alone, uh, income policies alone, food stamp policies alone, aftercare, pre-K, none of that stuff alone will work. You have to do it all. And so what the Harlem Children's Zone is, is an intense, all-purpose, 360-degree effort to surround kids with responsible, bourgeois adult institutions. And during the campaign, Obama was very drawn to this model and said, I want to create something like this in a lot of cities around the country. And I think that desire to create institutions, structures around individuals, rather than letting them be free to be you and me, uh, grows out of a certain view of human nature. Okay. You, you know what I'm thinking is that in some ways, because Obama is a post-60s liberal, he is in some ways a 30s and 40s liberal, right. uh, which is why there may be a natural fit between uh, him and Niebuhr, and also why he is proposing a New Deal program to spend $819 billion <laughs> on a lot of good things. Right. Um, and, but I, I think that's consistent, and I think um, that, now I, I think we should sort of be candid. He's a very good politician. He's good at appealing to particular groups, you know, feminists and union members and young people, and he, knows how to pander to that large group represented here on this stage of Niebuhr lovers. Uh, you know, and that I remember after David's investigative reporting outed him as a lover of Niebuhr, I was interviewing him and he said something, it was uh, during the Jeremiah Wright thing, and he said, and if that isn't Niebuhrian, I don't know what is. So <laughs> he's very conscious of this. But I think that when you think, you asked about his foreign policy, um, and I think that he is in so many ways a Niebuhrian realist. Um, indeed, in a lot of ways, I think that this foreign policy we are about to get will be much closer to the first President Bush's foreign policy than his son's was. Um, and that's a realism about the U.S. power, both why it's important and why we shouldn't be arrogant about it. Um, you know, that is the line in um, uh, uh, Obama's interview with uh, uh, Al Arabiya about our not telling the world what to do. I mean, there are some very Niborian lines in that, um, in that interview. Um, and so I think that it will be a kind of realism tinged with a 
uh, a certain moral uh, commitment. It's mm -hmm. this, this kind of, there's a tension in Niebuhr. Christian realism itself is uh, um, it's not an oxymoron, but boy, that's a concept that's in tension. Uh, and I think that will describe uh, uh, the, you know, the, form, uh, the, the Obama foreign policy. And I don't think a tension in a foreign policy is a bad thing. Yeah, can I just say, I mean, it is, you mentioned he's a politician. I mean, he gave, the, the big speech that launched him, which he wrote, was the Jefferson Jackson Day speech in, uh, I guess, November, December of 07 uh, in Iowa. And it was about as un in a speech as one could possibly imagine. It was all about history begins anew, uh, hope. I mean, it was pure American idealistic Whitman-esque theology. I mean, it was everything is going to be different. The history, we are not dragged down by anything. And that was, that was really the course that he rode through Iowa. So he can play many different strings, like all politicians. Although, you know, he has gone, been at great pains to distinguish between hope and optimism. Um, and, you know, he had that great riff in the early primaries where, you know, he'd say, they're calling me terrible things, they're calling me a hope monger. Uh, and then he would say that hope does not mean, and, by, and it didn't mean a soupy kind of optimism where you expect everything's going to go right. Hope knows that things will be hard, et cetera, et cetera. I don't disagree with the point you made, but I've always found fascinating the way he dealt with the word hope. I don't know if that makes him an He's boy. even hedging his hope. Uh, uh, you know, John Judas in the New Republic wrote a great piece, I thought a great piece, called uh, Barack Obama and the Adamic Tradition, uh, linking Obama to Billy Budd and to a whole series of figures in American literature that are purely innocent. And I, and I thought Obama was, was playing on those strings. Now, as it relates to foreign policy, one more interview story. Uh, I was interviewing him once about foreign policy, and the first half of the interview, it was about human rights. He sounded like Jimmy Carter or, you know, George Bush. Freedom, democracy. The last half of the interview, uh, he sounded like Brent Scowcroft. And in fact, he said, uh, you know, I want, I, uh, one of the foreign policy presidencies I truly admire is the first President Bush. Hmm. And so I said, oh, so you wouldn't have intervened in Yugoslavia? Uh, and, and I don't think he's re resolved that in his mind. And maybe that's a tension. Maybe that's a contradiction. Maybe it's just something which will be determined by events. I'm a huge believer, you know, there's this thing, trait psychology and situational psychology. Some people believe your traits determine how you behave through life. Most psychologists, I believe, think the situation determines. And when you're in office, you've got the power, you want to use it, uh, you become a lot more idealistic. And the history of American foreign policy is of realistic people getting into office and turning into Wilson or George W. Bush, uh, and whether smartly or not. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened to him. I will make a prediction that whatever he does, Barack Obama will not turn into George W. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> he just will hire his I mean, Secretary of Defense. And, uh, yeah, I the mean, one who cleaned up, of F, and never mind. Okay. One of the earliest moves he's had made, and given there, has, there hasn't been much time, but his stance he's taken on torture, on closing Guantanamo, on closing uh, secret prisons. You know, here again is an echo. Here's, this is Reinhold Niebuhr. We take and must continue to take morally hazardous actions to preserve our civilization. We must exercise our power, but we ought neither to believe that a nation is capable of perfect disinterestedness in its exercise, nor become complacent about particular degrees of interest and passion which corrupt the justice by, the exercise of, by which the exercise of power is legitimatized. Those are long sentences. But I was very fascinated to see how Obama talked about the action he took on torture and Guantanamo. You know, he said, we reject as false the choice between our safety and our ideals. We intend to win this fight. We will win it on our own terms. I mean, that's a moral statement. Well, the, that is my favorite Niebuhr quotation. Uh, and the phrase morally hazardous action <laughs> is a very complicated mm -hmm. phrase. I actually once used it in, the, in, a, in a column arguing for the Iraq war. I, I, without even citing Niebuhr, I said morally hazardous action. And then the hate mail I got for using that phrase was really striking. This was before mm. we knew what would happen. Uh, and, but, and of course, the question is, how morally hazardous? Uh, but, and I thought, in this case, to get back to Obama, I thought he, 
he uh, handled it in the way you would expect him to if he'd read all this stuff, which is to say there are certain things we will not do. And the, the conscience uh, was clear. On the other hand, he didn't just close, close Guantanamo. Right. He said, I'll close it in a year. I'll figure out somehow how to do it. Uh, and who knows what he'll, what he'll decide. I mean, he's known he wanted to close Guantanamo for a year. I don't know what took him so long. But he's, he left himself open, which I thought was morally the right thing to do, but also prudential. And the same with torture. We are not going to torture. We're not going to waterboard. On the other hand, we will have a task force so if we need to get rougher than the Army, ta the Army Manual, we'll do it. So shi clearly shifting moral directions, but leaving himself prudentially and out. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, a, that's a, a reasonably moral, but also cold-minded, or I shouldn't say cold-minded, cool-minded way of looking at the problem. You know, one of the Niebuhr quotes I brought with me is very similar to that one, also from the irony of American history. If we should perish the ruthlessness of the foe would, own, would be only the secondary cause of the disaster. The primary cause would be that the strength of a giant nation was directed by eyes too blind to see all the hazards of the struggle, and the blindness would be induced not by some accident of nature or history, but by hatred and vain glory. Right. And so it, it, you know, the notion that you can believe that American power can be used for good and have no illusions about ourselves, about American power, and be fearful that it might be used uh, for ill is, I think, what Niebuhr taught us. Um, and that I think the, the notion that Obama um, you know, did what he did on torture in Guantanamo, both in the, the prudential way he did it, but the fact that he did it, um, was certainly uh, consistent. Of course, with he was arguing view. against the sort of idealism, uh, idealistic pacifism, that was later exemplified by Helen Caldicott and people like that. Uh, I'm, I wonder if that that really exists today. You know, what he was arguing against with the, with this argument was not against the right. He was arguing against sort of the pacifist right, left. Right, Niebuhr. Yes. And no, but so he was I'm, also arguing. But it, see, and I think that's what. People who were trying to use Niebuhr to justify the Iraq war missed that he was not only arguing against the left, he was also uh, skeptical about American moralism. And he thought American moralism could be very dangerous, including to that America. Dang, that and danger of hubris. That double sidedness with, with of the, it. the German uh, diplomat who says, we'll be, we Europeans will be so weak we will not be able to stop you when you get really idealistic and ruin the world. <laughs> and I'm paraphrasing in a crude way, but that was the essential meaning. Uh, so that's that. But I, st I think it is important to remember where he was, who he was arguing against. And I'm not sure that that, that constellation of forces still exists today, where there, there is a sort of highly moralistic passivism that seeks to rise above history and not actually grapple with problems. Uh, I, I may say there were some people unwilling to grapple with Saddam Hussein. But passive has still exist. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I found, I actually found during the war that I wrote uh, sort of back-to-back -back columns. Somebody had written a column attacking pacifists, and I've always admired pacifists, even though I am not one, uh, and uh, discovered that actually, during the Vietnam War, I actually applied for CO status, wrote a long pacifist statement that I worked on very hard. I read it, and I read it, and I said, gee, this is pretty good, and there's only one problem, which is I don't believe it. Uh, and that's when I decided, in the course of writing that statement, that I was actually much more with Niebuhr and believed in a just, just war uh, a, approach. Not, it wasn't a highly sophisticated just war approach, I can assure you, at age 19. Um, but I came in that grappling with it. I had great admiration for the moral seriousness of the pacifist tradition. That's still there. And after writing the column, I, I can't remember which order I did it in, but I wrote the column defending pacifists, but then arguing, uh, partly using Niebuhr, for uh, mm -hmm. you know, my, prayer, my belief that uh, the, the just war view, at least for me, trumped the uh, pacifist view. And I think history suggested that it was true. So I think a Niebuhrian argument is still relevant, uh, even if, um, uh, yeah, I, I still think there's quite a viable pacifist movement there. You'll probably get hate mail from them for saying they're not there. Uh, <laughs> All right. Also. Actually, I don't gentle. fear them. I don't fear them. <laughs> I'm sorry. You'll get gently rebuking mail from them. <laughs>
there were a lot of Protestants, including liberal Protestants, who were very strongly opposed to the election of a Roman Catholic president. Right. Uh, and Niebuhr was not with those who were uh, opposed to that. He was, he, he was against the bigotry of uh, uh, the, you know, what he saw as bigotry uh, in some of the attacks on Kennedy, not, as I say, not only from the right, but also from a certain kind of anti-Catholic left. So my hunch is that he'd be a very interesting guide uh, to this moment. And that uh, I'm curious what Sean thinks, but I think he'd be, um, he would get this moment uh, uh, in our history quite well. I guess my, my main thought, and I don't know what Niebuhr would think of this, is that there's cause for worry about the, the extent of pluralism. Henry Steele Commenter had a line, uh, uh, in the 19th century, religion prospered while theology slowly went bankrupt. Uh, and what he meant by that is that we are not a doctrinal people. We're not a particularly theological people. And in 2004, I actually counted up the number of presidential candidates who had switched denominations at some point in their lives. And it was most of them. Uh, Howard Dean switched because of a fight about a bike path. Um, I think um, Wes Clark switched a number of times. The whole series of them had switched. And a lot of them for reasons one might not necessarily think were deeply philosophical. <laughs> uh, in fact, when Barack Obama was looking for a church, yes. it was not particular. It was not theological the decision. Right. And so the the pluralism in America is a is what many people you know have called shopping for faith and all that sort of stuff. And to me, it's 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 it blends into sort of a a good news sort of religion. Uh, which I think maybe he would have found uh, a little nervous making. I mean, the, the, uh, the, some of the soft core evangelicalism uh, is, is pretty sunny and uplifting. And uh, if you feel down, well, we've got a Bible study group for that too. Uh, well, I, I think I, you're, you're talking about a, a Christian phenomenon, and, and then there is just this demographic fact of Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, yeah, we're all Americans, though, and we all have an uplifting faith, uplifting versions of our faith. And in the Jewish tradition, now I can tell you having, you know, if you, let me tell you a story. Once uh, I was at a, a synagogue here where I go in Washington, D.C. There's a story read by a young woman in the Devar Torah, which is the discussion in the middle of the service. And it's a, a fiction, a short story she's written of Isaac talking to Abraham. And she's uh, saying, you know, Abraham, and Abraham is dead in his grave, and Isaac is saying farewell. You know, after that day when you nearly killed me, we never really communicated as father to son. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, and it was like uh, you're in an Orthodox service. This is a very serious service, and suddenly the Oprah Winfrey show breaks out. <laughs> and, and this is the nature of a lot of American okay. religion. I want to. Uh, <laughs> and that's that's I that. Bring I think this he back to liked. another place. All right. <laughs> What did you want to say, I, I Just very quickly, I, I, I share David's general uh, view there, but I don't, and I think Niebuhr would have been very skeptical of a kind of therapeutic faith that's, uh, trans, that crosses all kinds of lines. I'm not sure that is exactly the same as uh, belief in pluralism or religious tolerance. In other words, I think there is sort of a hard if you will, a theologically hard, and most of us are not theologically hard, but there's a theologically hard argument that can uh, be respectful and also mindful of the importance of toleration of differences about religion and still be quite serious. Well, I mean, here, here's another way, and this is coming at it from a slightly different angle, it, in which Niebuhr stands very much, although he was a deeply religious person, a, a theologian and public intellectual, uh, very much in contrast to, say, the 1980s religious right. Even though he was bringing faith into the public square, there was nothing proselytizing about it. So, and, and here again, I, I found an interesting parallel. So this is, uh, this is, this is actually uh, something that Reinhold Niebuhr's, something I found uh, that Ronald Stone, his last teaching assistant, described about him. Um, that he had a deep personal religiosity, but disdained discussion of personal beliefs in the public square. And this is what Ronald Stone, he said that far better to have good political ideas and a way to carry them out pragmatically 
than to win votes through pious protestations. Religious language should be inspired by love, but translated through the vocabulary of justice into the political realm. And here's Barack Obama in 2006. Democracy demands that the religiously motivated translate their concerns into universal rather than religion-specific values. It requires that their proposals be subject to argument and amenable to reason. I have, in other words, he says, I have to explain why abortion violates some principle that is accessible to people of all faiths, including those with no faith at all. Well, the first thing I would say is, if you look at George Bush's speeches, the current, the recent one, you will find, A, only appeals to universal values. Uh, you will probably find that in a lot of the best religious right leaders. Uh, and, you know, I, so, I, you know, I, I don't think Niebuhr or Obama would be too much different from what Obama won than what, uh, say, George Bush exemplified, who was pure universal philosophy in his second inaugural. Uh, so, you know, I, they're, they're probably, and then the second thing, the objection to personal protestations of faith. This really is another area where he is distinct from, well, I don't know, I don't want to He put Niebuhr? This, he Niebuhr is distinct from mainstream American culture, where personal protestations of faith are deeply moving to people and deeply mobilizing. And if you look at every movement that is mobilizing, it may have a Niburian element, but is also deeply inspiring and vaguely utopian. Whether it's John F. Kennedy, or even Martin Luther King, or Abraham Lincoln, and it, it had none of the features of the, of the prayer Gene read at the beginning. <laughs> And this is where the limitations of Niebuhr. He did not know how to mobilize people. Can I, <laughs> well, he organized some, he was actually an organizer and an activist, but let me, let me try, maybe there is a part, a, there are problems with trying to transpose Niebuhr from his time to ours. It seems to me you can make a case that we have gone through many cycles in the public expression of religion. And, you know, I think, for example, if you go back to the 1928 election, uh, two major issues in that election, David and I covered it together, um, <laughs> were prohibition and whether Al Smith should be the first Roman Catholic president. This is a culture war election. Then something intervenes, the Great Crash, the Great Depression. By 1932, a lot of people may have needed a drink, but the issue of whether they could buy it legally or not was not really that important compared to whether you could afford it. In other words, suddenly the culture of politics went away and we began a long, relatively secular period, not secular in the sense that presidents didn't invoke God, but the kind of Niebuhr you describe was a typical figure of that period, 1932 to 1980. Um, then you had the rise of religious conservatism and the mobilization of uh, the religious right, and then we entered a different period. I think that we are gonna date this 1980 to 2008, and I think we're at the end of that particular um, you know, stretch, partly because, again, we face such serious uh, secular problems uh, that these other issues are, will still be important to people, but they'll recede from the public square. So maybe, if that theory is right, uh, your whole theory that Barack Obama is really just the reincarnation of Reinhold Niebuhr will be proven true because <laughs> the Niebuhrian um, approach will again be relevant to this post-2008 you know, period, even more than he was 1980 to 2008. Hmm. Um, let's take questions. Michael, where are you? There. So Michael Kessler of the um, Berkeley Institute is going to, um, Berkeley Center is going to summarize or read some questions. We have... About 15 minutes. Well, the first is rhetorically flourishing, so I will read it. Okay, okay, so Obama is channeling Niebuhr. But what did Niebuhr get wrong? What shouldn't Obama channel from Niebuhr? Good. What, the, uh, nothing. Niebuhr got nothing. <laughs> um, the, you know, I, the, it's possible... It's possible that he didn't f resolve the tensions in his own thought well enough. Uh, that there is, 
you know, he got hit a lot. He's gotten hit at various moments in history. He got hit by the left a fair amount uh, in the 60s and 70s for being excessively pessimistic, too much of a realist, therefore too willing, you know, in their view to become a cold warrior and all that. Now, I don't object to all that as much as uh, some of my friends did in those years. Um, you know, I think the anti-totalitarian Niebuhr was broadly right in the end. Um, but I think there is sort of tension between his sort of hopeful Christianity and his realism, and maybe it's the very thing in Obama that's so close to Niebuhr that is the thing he's gonna have to struggle with. Hmm. I guess I would say, you got, he did, I've hinted at this, but he did get the meaning of America wrong. And, and he took a highly offensive hyper-patriotism, his distaste for that, and I would say he let that bleed in over into a complete dismissal of the idea that America has a unique mission in the world. And in my view, America does have a unique mission in the world. It was born into our history, and that if we didn't, weren't conscious of this mission, uh, as last best hope and all that stuff, uh, then we wouldn't be America. And I thought Niebuhr was too quick to dismiss uh, American exceptionalism. Hmm. And, and I think there's a case to be made that his view of America's role uh, was because it was so realistic and not, did not see the special mission, he actually in some ways became a better defender of, uh, of America's intervention when it needed to intervene. He didn't need a theory of American exceptionalism to argue that we had to fight the Nazis or Imperial Japan or Stalin. And there's some value in that, I think. The next question is about the international arena. What would Niebuhr say about international social justice? Specifically, do we need to intervene to correct economic injustice and abuses of human rights in other countries? We're going to be passing out uh, little bracelets at the end of this that say WWNS. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I don't know the answer to that question, actually. I'm curious if any of our Niebuhr scholars, because I, you know, it, it, humanitarian intervention is in certain ways very Niborian, in other ways counter Niborian. Uh, and I could see, you know, I could see him being very troubled and taking a case by case view, but I'm not, I, I would have no claim that I'm right about that. I don't know what right, you're I completely agree. And say Rwanda, the case of Rwanda, uh, I really don't know. I don't know. Staying in the international arena, uh, a person asks, much of Niebuhr's writings were a reflection on communism. How do you think he might revise his worldview in the face of the threat of radical Islam? I don't agree with that, by the way, the, with the premise of the question. I mean, communism was clearly very important to him at a certain stage uh, in the Cold War. But, you know, I mean, his original, you know, Christian realism came out of a fight with uh, the social gospel movement, an argument with the social gospel movement. So while communism was important in a very important public period in his life. I don't think it was the animating passion. He just was against it. I believe in the Iron Age of American history, he uses a phrase akin to satanic to describe communism. Something like that, if I'm not mistaken. And that, that. Right, no, he was an anti-communist. Yeah, yeah, he was, he's not I sort of hedging his bets dominant. on that. Uh, yeah. And so the question is, would he see Islamic extremism as the same thing? And, Again, I don't know, but I think it's completely consistent. And in fact, as we were talking about taking morally hazardous action, as EJ was talking, I was thinking about the Israeli incursion into Gaza, which is a, which I think is one of those actions, while horrible in its effect, is one of those morally hazardous but justified actions, justified by the complete evilness of the Hamas leadership. And, and that's the sort of issue that he takes you into. How, how does he take you into that? Well, you're saying, look, you're, they're bombing schools. And do you say, I will not bomb schools, but I will therefore tolerate Hamas and what Hamas is doing? Or do you say, uh, I will, I need to take action against Hamas. Taking action against Hamas will involve bombing schools. Now, I, I think there is no firm universal rule to apply how you apply that. Mm -hmm. But this is the vocabulary you, you, he, he supplies you as you're wrestling with that question. I could imagine his saying that, but could you also imagine his asking questions such as, 
does this intervention have the effect in the long run of strengthening Hamas, of making the two-state solution even more difficult, of weakening Fatah? I mean, I could imagine uh, his kind of analysis being complicated in that way and uh, raising questions about the intervention. I, I'm, again, I have no right. clue as to but I, but where I do he'd think land. That, well, I mentioned that satanic about the Soviet Union because he does introduce the idea there are some foes which are uniquely and totally uh, hostile to you and moral values. But he was against the Vietnam War. You know, right. And so again, right. he, he, he was anti-communist but believed that that war was wrong and counterproductive. Right. And so that's right. He looked Niebuhr. closely at the particular circumstances yeah. of each crisis. Yeah. There's this line from Irony of American History, we are drawn into an historic situation in which the paradise of our domestic security is suspended in a hell of global insecurity. I mean, that could apply as much to global terrorism as to communism. I'm going to distill this question which is about value and constraints on our political actions. As we explore dynamic ways of engaging our faith in the political arena, how can we find collective ethics uh, that are not merely based on utility? And this was provoked, I um, suggested that uh, E.J. Dion seemed to speak of pacifism not as um, an unfaithful act, but as not viable in the political arena. The, well, the, just, I, I, I'm happy to talk to whoever asked that question afterward. I don't want to go on a sidetrack. It seems to me it's not simply about viability. It's about whether it is legitimate to resist evil through violence. And what, when I was writing my little pacifist statement, I kept stumbling on Hitler. Uh, and I kept stumbling on the Holocaust and stumbling on World War II. And I decided that no matter how I cut it, I concluded that World War II was a just war. Now, pure pacifists would argue that it wasn't. And, I, you know, and there were conscientious objectors in our country during World War II, and God bless them. But I just felt that there were certain evils that we did have a right to resist through violence. And I could imagine engaging in that violence myself. And so that was the... Uh, so it wasn't about viability. It was a, for me, it was a moral question, and that's how I answered in fear and trembling that moral question. I work in the interreligious arena. Someone asks, Niebuhr seemed to work hard at proving the superiority of the Christian Jewish mythos for interpreting and changing history. How intrinsic is this to Niebuhr's Christian realism? If intrinsic, does this not limit the effectiveness of his work in our multi-faith, pluralistic world? I'm not, I'm not qualified to really answer that question. I, I would think that's also about the time in which he lived. I mean, inter-religious dialogue in the 1960s was Christians and Jews. First of all, it was a huge leap in this country for Protestants and Catholics to talk to each other. <laughs> Adding Jews was radical, so I didn't... I guess all you can do is try to judge from how he behaved in the circumstance in which he found himself. And if he, he was more in advance on interreligious dialogue than behind, and because he was more open at that time than most others, one could at least right. could imagine his taking uh, the same, you know, being also ahead I mean, on his, further interreligious dialogue. His friendship dialogue. with Abraham Joshua Heschel was an extraordinary thing. Right. For the time. The, yeah, I, don't I don't know, know if it was, I mean, I in liberal that, circles, Abraham I think Joshua that was Heschel couldn't go a day without running at some Protestant theologian. He was <laughs> yeah. filthy with it. They were best <laughs> friends. <laughs> the, you don't like Heschel? No, I don't. I don't want to. You got a problem? I've got the pacifist, now I've got the Heschel family. <laughs> in writing the Constitution, Madison was sensitive to the fact that men are not angels. How would you compare this idea to Niebuhr's approach? Again, it, it's a group of people, and I made this crack about Lincoln. It's a group of people who have this tragic view of human nature. I was actually, for something else I was working on, I was running across an exchange of letters that Madison had with, uh, with Jefferson. I think I've got this right. Uh, and Jefferson wanted the, Const the US Constitution to be repealed every 19 years on the grounds that no generation should bind another generation. And now I'm beginning to doubt whether it's Madison or Adams. 
Uh, but anyway, the opposing view, <laughs> which is the darker view, is that are you crazy? Uh, <laughs> we we do, do not create our own lives. We are the inheritors of, and must be the inheritors, of vast reservoirs of institutions because we are simply not capable of it. And that's a humility that grows out of a tragic condition. And then what's always struck me is that out of that humility, you get a guy who writes a book called The Nature and Destiny of Man, <laughs> my favorite book title of all time. Because after you've written that book, what else is left to say? Uh, but so he had, but, but I do think that Madison and Adams, if we want to throw him in, and Lincoln, uh, and I would say Burke and others, uh, and even a contemporary uh, Isaiah Berlin, uh, you, you see this strain that runs across many people. And I think Berlin is interesting because he and I think Niebuhr responded to the utopianism that was floating around those days with this idea that, that the whole world doesn't go together, that all good values don't go together. And before we go, I just, you know, Sam Huntington, the great political scientist, died recently. He was a pure Niburian, a very self-confessed Niburian. And his, it, this turned him into a, an arch-realist on all matters. Hmm. And one of his, his early books, again, part of this tradition, there was a theory floating around in the 50s and 60s called modernization theory, which was if you take developing countries, you can have democracy, higher education, secularism, all these good things, and they'd all go together. And Huntington, taking a more tragic view of human nature, said, well, if you introduce democracy and education together, you're probably going to get disorder. And so he said, yeah, they're all good things, but they do not all go together. And so one of his early works was about the inherent contradictions between good things. And again, so what I'm describing is a tradition that a lot of people have tapped into, which Niebuhr and, and Madison were part of, and Lincoln. Just very quickly, on the Madison point, I, the, I, I like to do this every so often because it makes me sound more intelligent. I like to read that great passage from Lincoln's second inaugural because it goes to this Madisonian Niebuhr point. Um, many of you know it. Both sides read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. He's speaking of the North and the South. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we not be judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. And Niebuhr said that this passage, and I'm quoting Niebuhr now, puts the relation of our moral commitments in history to our religious reservations about the partiality of our own moral commitments more precisely than I think any statesman or theologian has put them. And I think this is that Madison-Lincoln uh, Niebuhr marriage. Or I guess that's polygamy, isn't it? <laughs> Gay marriage. We probably have time for one more question. And the last one is forward-looking. Is there anyone in current American political discourse, in thought and culture, who might be compared to Niebuhr, who might be the next person with influence like Niebuhr? EJ. <laughs> oh, God bless you. <laughs> David, um, the Krista Tippett. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have one quick answer about that, which is that my favorite period of American social science is the period roughly between 55 and 65. And this was a period when you could write, you had a series of public intellectuals who were not lost in academic disciplines, but who were much higher brow than your average journalist. And there was a whole community of people like this, and whether it was Reisman or Digby Baltzell or you know, even Irving Kristol, or there are a whole group of people. And Niebuhr was writing for this audience. And in this audience, you could title a book called The Nature and Destiny of Man, and people wouldn't laugh at you because they were used to certain big, daring thoughts, Jacques Barzin, you know, people like that partisan review crowd. And so in my view, he came out of that sort of tradition, which was big thoughts, big ideas, capital letters, but, and combined with a general fluency. In my view, people like that today are either lost to the academy, uh, and 
I didn't mean lost in a negative way. <laughs> but they're writing books like um, Heart and Soul, Indian Basket Weaving in 1624, uh, which are specialized. Uh, or, or, they're, or they're lost uh, to journalism. And, you know, we cover the stimulus package and what Keith Oberman said last night. Uh, and, uh, or they're doing something else. So I just think the, tr the milieu that created these big, daring public intellectuals just isn't there right now. Let me try that a little differently because there's something to what you say. But it's also, I wonder how we sort of receive these folks. You know, I could think of, you know, the thinkers that important to me, people like Michael Walzer, Mike Sandel, Gene. Um, you know, there are public intellectuals of a very high caliber who think in, a, in I think, a serious moral way uh, who are accessible. Uh, I would put the folks I mentioned in that category. There are others we could uh, think of. Um, and yet you wonder about the nature of the media at the time because it did seem that in, I mean, Niebuhr was on the cover of Time Magazine, Paul Tillich was on the cover of uh, Time Magazine, I don't know if Heschel uh, was ever on the cover of Time. Time, Time had a weekly theology page. Mm -hmm. Every yes. week they mm -hmm. had a theology page. Um, and, you know, and there are, we have had serious theologians in our time, of, you know, like we could probably go through a significant uh, list. Um, and I'm wondering what it is about the public culture, because I don't think it's that those folks don't exist. And I think, in fact, the tendency toward narrow specialization that you described over a period, I think the academy is breaking out of that again. I think there's sort of some, the trend, the pressure is starting, I think, fortunately, to go uh, the other way. Uh, but it would be very hard to be Reinhold Niebuhr right now, I think. I also think that the question, who is the Niebuhr of our day, may not be the most interesting question. I mean, you, you could not and should not have a white, male, Midwestern, Protestant theologian who had such a privileged voice, you know, even media, if, if media was receptive to that kind of discussion. But, you know, isn't it fascinating that we have an African-American, in fact, biracial president whose parents were Muslim and atheist, who is a Christian realist. I mean, I think that is what we need to look at to open, <laughs> to open our imaginations about what the Niebuhr of our day will look like. And I think it's going to be a very multiply articulated, diverse thing. No, but I think he could be all those, you know, white, Protestant, Midwestern, he could be that. Or he could be uh, African-American. I mean, Martin Luther King's religious writings uh, and some of his sermons have, be, partly because he was a student in Niebuhr, partly because he had his own uh, thoughts from his struggle. He was this kind of public intellectual who was also uh, an activist. So I think, um, you know, I, I think it, you, know, you could reproduce Niebuhr, but it could also be someone else. It could be... But I don't Indian think it's going to be one person in one place. You know, I think there are going to be many Niebuhrs in different communities. But there were at the time. I mean, in fairness, we are Niebuhr-obsessed. I mean, there are... Uh, people here who were <laughs> Tillich, you know, obsessed. There were John Courtney Murray, where the Catholic but, school was a pretty important, uh, you know, world-changing public figure in certain ways. Heschel, um, you know, so I agree with you. But, but I think we're just talking about someone who played a very particular role. Mm -hmm. But it is true that there was authority granted to people like that because of the publicly understood role of the intellectual, whether it's Lionel Trilling or Niebuhr or somebody like that. No, no one has that authority. Well, I think the relative homogeneity of the culture as well compared to now. Maybe. Or maybe it's just time magazine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am going to let Reinhold Niebuhr have the last word from this sweet, battered library uh, book of the, the Irony of American History. We cannot expect even the wisest of nations to escape every peril of moral and spiritual complacency, for nations have always been constitutionally self-righteous. But it will make a difference whether the culture in which the policies of nations are formed is only as deep and as high as the nation's highest ideals, or whether there is a dimension in the culture from the standpoint of which the element of vanity in all human ambitions and achievements is discerned. The realm of mystery and meaning, which encloses and finally makes sense out of the baffling configurations of history, is not identical with any scheme of rational intelligibility. 
The faith which, appropriate, which appropriates the meaning in the mystery inevitably involves an experience of repentance for the false meanings which the pride of nations and cultures introduces into the pattern. Such repentance is the true source of charity, and we are more desperately in need of genuine charity than of more technocratic skills. Well, I think this has been a thrilling discussion. You can pick up your little bracelets at the back. Thank you, Eugene.